Hello, good evening, everyone. Hello, thank you guys for joining us here in another episode of UNCG Chance. Um, well, thank you guys for joining us to learn more about what to study at UNCG from our magnificent faculty members. My name is Yubi Aranda Sandoval. I work in the Office of Alumni Engagement as an Assistant Director, and I will be serving as your moderator tonight for our panel, panel discussion. As you have seen, UNCG Chance has gone virtual. For the past few years, UNCG Chance has been providing an immersive six-day summer experience for Latinx rising high school juniors and seniors. During their time on campus, students were able to participate in a variety of experiences that gave them a glimpse of life as a UNCG student. They engaged with a host of university professors, current students, alumni, and staff to forge a network of meaningful connections focused on academic success and personal growth. The program was created to encourage Latinx students to attend college by increasing their awareness of higher education and showing that it is well within their reach. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has forced us to, to pause our face-to-face -face camp experience and find a safe way to engage with students who are seeking information about how they too can reach their goal of attending and completing college. Through te technology and dedication, we have brought together faculty, staff, students, and alumni to share with students across the state and beyond how every student can find their chance here at UNC Greensboro. Allow me to introduce you to our panelists tonight. Let's start with Julie. Tell me, tell us your name, what you teach, and one of your favorite hobbies. Okay, well, thanks for having me, Yubi. My name is Julia Mendez Smith. I'm in the Department of Psychology and I have taught several classes. I've been here 13 years. So I teach child psychology, which is all about what happens to children when they're growing up. And I teach classes in how to become a therapist and how to work with people in counseling. Um, I have a fun hobby since we've started spending more time at home. There's two. So one is I tried to make a garden because I thought if I was outside, I would like everything to look nice and pretty. And um, so I've been doing some gardening. And then I've also been learning how to play baseball. Um, so I have some children who like to play baseball. So I'm playing baseball with them. Nice. And what kind of flowers have you been able to plant in your garden now? I have been growing hydrangeas, azaleas, hosta, daylilies in three different colors, UNCG coordinated, of course. <laughs> and I don't know, some other things that grow and I don't know what they look like, but they're pretty or what they're called. I love hydrangeas. Beautiful, beautiful gardens. Yes. Thank you, Julie. Wade, let's move to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Wade Mackey. I'm a member of the philosophy department. And in addition to teaching philosophy courses like business ethics, I also teach in the liberal studies program. Some of my favorite hobbies include gardening where I grow purple sweet potatoes. And I also have Havanese dogs. That's the national dog of Cuba. You may hear them or see one of the little fluffy guys running by any moment. But one of them and I, we do agility. That means he and I run through the jumps and the the uh, obstacle courses together. And that's what I do for fun. I enjoy watching Wade's videos on his Facebook. Cute, cute pups. Armando, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, my name is Dr. Armando Collins. I am a visiting assistant professor in African American studies and African diaspora studies. And what I teach is Introduction to African American Studies, Blacks in American Society, and now this year, a film studies course related to portrayals of African American images in American media. 
I'm also the department head of the Digital Media Commons, which is an instructional support service housed and operated by Jackson Library. What we do is help people better understand how to effectively use digital media to do research and create research related and entrepreneurial related products. Oh, uh, and if we're talking about free time, just to be honest, you guys, here's what I do. In addition to reading books, I am a super duper E40 fan. If you love rap music, you know E-40 is a West Coast artist. Anybody joining us from California totally gets what I'm saying. If you were on the East Coast, you probably don't. But when I am not studying or teaching or making syllabuses and all that other good stuff, I am probably either reciting or learning E-40 lyrics. It's eventually going to come into something productive, but this is what I'm doing right now. Give me my free time. Awesome. I can't wait to hear some of those spins. <laughs> we'll be uh, listening to them on LinkedIn and Armando, Dr. Armando Collins giving us a rhyme here. <laughs> awesome. Don't make, me, don't make me spit a hot 16 right here. It's not that hot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Collins. Marissa Gonzalez, how are you? Hola, buenas noches. My name is Marisa Gonzalez, and I teach for languages, literatures, and cultures, Spanish, of course, and also I also teach for the residential colleges. Um, I work full time as a staff member as well at the university teaching and learning commons. And also, I guess, not a disclaimer or whatnot, but I'll, I'm also going to talk a little bit about my experience as a student here because I was a student. Um, as an undergrad and also as a master's student and currently also pursuing a PhD here. So, and something that I like to do for fun is I've discovered I like to do school for fun. That's one thing. Um, but knowing that this is my what eighth year enrolled in a class at UNCG, um, but I also love to spend time with my family, my niece and my nephew in particular, because they're in this age where they just love to learn new things and just everything just amazes them. So that's what I like to do for fun. That's sweet. Yeah, uh, children's brains are sponges um, as Dr. Uh, Menda Smith will uh, attest to that. <laughs> and it's good to get them while they're young and absorb everything positive that they can, huh? Mm -hmm. um, okay, perfect. Well, thank you guys for having or for joining us and for having me as your moderator. <laughs> Happy to be here. Um, so we're going to move into some questions that we had lined up. Um, first question is for some of our um, professors teaching, you know, different majors. Tell, tell us about the majors in your department or area. Uh, we'll start with uh, Wade. Thank you. So I can speak to two areas. In philosophy, uh, we have a major that is all about asking questions. Four-year-olds make great philosophers. If you like asking why, why is, why is this just, why does that exist, uh, then philosophy is a good field for you. But it's not just about asking questions. It's about sharpening your communication skills, the ability to ask the right question, make the right argument, employ evidence to help bolster your position, to understand what other people are saying, to break that down into what assumptions are behind their reasoning and have that dialogue back and forth. This leads to all kinds of interesting careers, whether it's uh, in the legal field or just about anything else. It's not like accounting where you become an accountant. When you study philosophy, you have skills that transfer to any number of careers. The other area I represent is the liberal studies program. And the important point there is the liberal studies program is an interdisciplinary program. So if you like a little bit of a lot of different things, it's a sort of program that is designed for you. For example, we have a social science track where students take some psychology, some sociology, some geography, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that becomes the basis for their degree or the humanities track, which involves some religious studies. It involves some literature some fine arts, and that becomes a track. Because again, these are about teaching you skills that can apply across careers, because most of the careers that the kids who come to college today are gonna to have 
haven't been invented yet. And most people don't realize that, but when I went to college, there was no internet, but almost all of us now work in some way with the internet. So it's about picking up those skills. Thank you. Wade, no, absolutely. Um, we have new ways of tapping into resources that we didn't have um, several years ago. <laughs> I remember, you know, I do remember grabbing an encyclopedia and pulling it and having to pull out information from an encyclopedia. Um, that's not, you know, it's much easier nowadays, but. Um, Julie, let's move on to you. Same question. Tell us about majors in your department or area. Okay. Um, thanks, Yubi. I want to tell you that psychology is a really broad discipline, even though a lot of people have heard of psychology. I don't think they realize all the different specialty areas within psychology. So in our department, we have two areas. There's an experimental program and there's a clinical program. Now I'm in the clinical program and what we're looking to do is to apply knowledge to help people learn things. And sometimes this means that we're working with people that have emotional troubles or child behavior problems um, or problems in living because um, living is a hard thing and you're gonna encounter some struggles. And so psychologists are there to help people develop ways of coping um, and also get people back on track. So to build that resilience whether or not that's in counseling or the way I do it is I work with parents and young children in preschool programs. And so what we do <clears throat> is bring families together and help them understand and cope with stress so that they can have successful lives. So there's nothing more rewarding than me getting to run a workshop and see the light bulbs go off in young children when they're going to their parents and learning how to communicate and bring all those pieces together. Now on the experimental side, there's much more opportunity to do research. And so research is really just a fancy word for studying something that you're interested in. So cognitive psych psychologists study the mind and how things like memory and language work. Developmental psychologists study how people grow and change over time from being little infants to being fully formed adults. And even when you're an adult, you're still growing and learning. Look at Marissa, she's just taking classes for eight years. Think of all the things she's learned. So um, that's what developmental psychologists do. And then we also have social psychologists in the psychology department. And social psychologists are really interested in groups of people and how individuals get along. So the ways in which groups come together, different racial groups, ethnic groups, how things have changed over time, stereotypes, discrimination, all of these types of topics are studied by social psychologists. So if you come to UNCG and study in the psychology department, you get to be a part of that research and it's a really exciting thing. Um, I also just wanted to share that I did a little digging because psychologists love to work with numbers and data about people. And so I found out that recently we are up to over 100 majors from Latino, Latina, Latinx backgrounds in the psychology department and we have overall about seven or eight hundred majors at any given year so just a great fun place to study and meet um, your interests if these are things or topics that you like to know more about yes and i am going to put a plug in about you know doing research i remember being in um i am a um, psychology major and I was involved in Camino's lab. I wanted to, I know that I wanted to be in a lab where I could help um, a community. And then I found Camino's lab and um, I helped individuals, immigrants, um, immigrant families. Uh, so it was something that I really wanted to know more about. And the lab just opens up a lot of opportunities to get to know the graduate uh, school um, students. Uh, those PhD candidates to know like what they are going through as they're going through their PhD um, and to know more about what they are researching. So it was a great insight um, to, to know like if do I want to you know pursue psychology as um, a PhD student or um, a master's and go in a different route. So 
there's a lot of things to learn in, in many of our schools and our departments. Um, thank you, Julie, for that. I also have another plug for the Undergraduate Research and the Creativity Office, because um, it's housed under the UTLC. Um, so if you're looking to come to UNCG, um, that office so provides support to both faculty and students, um, both monetary and also by providing workshops and other type of advice and support. So also another thing to keep in mind when you come to UNCG. Thank you, Marisa. See, these are things that um, sometimes we have to stay commun um, in community with our own faculty and our staff uh, to know what different departments are doing so that we keep our students um, in touch with all of these departments so that they can take advantage of these opportunities. Um, because if we, you know, we don't bridge those silos, then we are not doing the work that we need to be doing. And I, I know that when we are communicating and doing this chance camp, we're finding new resources for our students and we are trying to put that out there for our students as well. Um, let's, um, Armando, tell us about your, um, your department. What are you know, majors in or areas um, in your area or your department? I'm sorry, thank you. Well, I'm going to uh, approach the question um, from two tracks, uh, both talking about AADS as well as talking about the library as an integral part of life and learning, mm -hmm. because both are uh, personal passions and important. Trust me, if I meander, it's because they're important. Uh, African-American studies uh, as a discipline is not just important for vocational purposes, but it is. Like getting a job, it actually is important. Understanding the history of race and racism in the United States for everyone, no matter what your racial or ethnic background is. We have all been impacted by it, but the way African-American studies is constructed and approached especially at our university, is such that it talks about a history of the African-American experience that underscores and in many instances highlights the inherent inequality of Americanness in the form of capitalism and whiteness and racial race and racism as social visions. Everyone in the contemporary moment is impacted by the story, history, and analytic discussion of the African-American experience. What I tell my students is it's one of the few disciplines that is no further divorced from what you read in a book than you looking up. It is not an abstract concept that is being talked about. It's real lived experience. And if you ever, as an American, feel behind, I would suggest, and this is my personal bias, it's because you don't understand the stories that we're telling within this discipline as practical functional knowledge of Americanness. The people who constructed this field and the people that they're talking about understood race and racism as fundamental parts operant in the functional life and living of the United States and constructed it to be like a, an intellectual repository of that information. But that information doesn't just impact Black people. In America, Black people are the baseline in many respects for what gets constructed on every level of society as the underclass. But everybody can get lumped in the underclass. This is America. Anybody can get it. And everybody does get it. But the idea of race and racism have mystified or made cloudy or made not unintelligible, but hard to understand 
power relationships. Who actually wins and who actually loses. And it's done so in a way that power is given in incremental measures to the powerless, to keep the powerless fighting against one another. This is the narrative that we tell, or at least in my classes, and they let me do this and they pay me. I'm pretty sure everybody else is doing this because there's literature that underscores all of this. But these conversations, no matter how I approach them or anyone else, are fundamental to the American experience. And all of us as labor, social, in political entities in this thing that we call a society have to understand how the power dynamics of society do and have operated and understanding the stories that we tell in my particular discipline help us all do with that. Moreover, on a more practical vocational level, for those of you who may be coming into UNCG and thinking about picking a major or minor, I would suggest considering uh, AADS as a major or minor as a practical vocation. We're at a moment post George Floyd, and I would, and I use post very tentatively because I still think we're in that historical moment. That historical moment had antecedents that still have not been resolved with us as a country. Moreover, K through 12, and now it, it has already been instituted, but now it's even going to be further gas in higher education, African-American studies, is a part of the core curriculum. You're going to need people to do that. Who is qualified to do that? What we've all been confronted with, even me, who studied this since he was a kid, have been confronted with the, our lack of knowledge and the requirement that we get more. Who's going to do it? It is a vocational field. It's not just a uh, cultural competence. However, as I've said before, it's a necessary cultural competence if you want to survive in America. If you want to survive in America and you don't understand how race operates in everything, just like you, you, are, you are disadvantaging yourself in ways similar to if you didn't understand how sexism impacts the way society uh, was constructed and functions. And don't create a uh, lane for yourself where you try to actively deconstruct that in your life, in the life of other people. You ain't doing it right. That's what we teach in ADS, and that's the type of scholar citizen that we create in that field of endeavor. Now, to belabor my, my talking time, the library. The library is the site historically, cross-culturally, especially in Western culture, for the, the training of, of knowledge in society. It's where you go to get it from, and that's where you go to put it once you've actually created it. Whatever it is that we call knowledge. With our particular library, we do a lot in service of furthering the idea of literacy not just uh, English literacy, learning the concepts of grammar and syntax in a five paragraph essay, literacy. That's not what we do. we do. We do a lot of that, but it's not just that. It's information literacy, it's digital literacy, it's cultural literacy. It's the ability to Research, inf what we teach in our library and what we support is the ability to go find information that you're interested in, go find competent resources that can help augment your competence in that particular field. And we also provide the resources to help you reproduce knowledge for other people in whatever field of endeavor you do. 
what libraries don't get credit for, and this is Armando's personal spin on libraries. I got hours on this, but I'm only gonna give you th two minutes. Libraries help provide access to the technologies that make our lives go. Think about how many people go to a library just to access a computer. The computer revolution would not have been facilitated without libraries. And if we snatch computers out of libraries right now, we've done all of ourselves a disservice. But though you can't just put a computer in a space and make it go. The people who work there are what make it go. They tell you how to get, how to make the thing work and how to find the thing that you were looking for to make when you were trying to make the thing work. We also provide the resources. And what we, this is something new that we made a pointed decision to do. We provide the resources to emerging technologies that allow you to produce in ways beyond uh, passive creation, like just jumping on the internet. We provide access to the, the latest uh, cameras, the latest uh, web technologies. Yeah. And we charge ourselves with doing that. And we listen to our, our audience to do that. In academic libraries specifically, we've been trying to do that in North Carolina across the board, but at UNCG specifically, that's where student services dollars that go to the library actually go to, and those are important. It shows a commitment to student success. And the reason like we're even holding events like this is and talking about these different uh, disciplines and how they apply to practical real world experiences because we care about our students and their being successful, not just at our school. It's cool if you matriculated, but, and you be, if I'm wrong, tell me alumni affairs, if once you matriculate, we're not, we didn't stop following you. We wanna see what your career trajectory is because the goal wasn't for you to get a degree from us and for us to juice you out of money. Mm -hmm. It was for us to set you up for success that is gonna carry you on for the rest of your life. Yep. And that's what any degree usually does. If you don't believe me, go ask someone with a degree. And if they, if they say that that is not true, ask them how they fed their family yesterday. Ask them how they fed themselves. I graduated from Livingstone College, a small HBCU liberal arts college in uh, Salisbury, North Carolina. Church school. I have been eating off of that degree since 1999. My kids have been. And it has, as a first generation student, there wasn't anybody with no support getting through this. There wasn't anybody before me who could tell me how to do it. And there was nobody in my immediate presence to support me doing it. That degree changed my life and changed the trajectory of my kids' lives. And that's what we try to do every day with students who come to UNCG. Because if you look at the support roles of people who are actually dealing with you, many of them have that same story that a lot of people who are watching this have. And it's important that you do have that support because it is going to make a difference, that final degree. You can't do it by yourself and you shouldn't. But to my original meandering point, the library and ADS can help support uh, any student from any background and if you uh, use us effectively, we can help leverage you from freshman to career in both areas. And that's what we historically do in both areas. That's correct. Um, there, there was a question from one of our alums. Um, can I still use the library um, even if I've you know, left? And we said, yes, absolutely. We are actually open to the community um, in Greensboro. Uh, people from you know, the community can walk into our library and utilize um, many of the resources that we have in our libraries. 
if you are a student here, you are set to use the, the, the um, I forget what it's called downstairs, but it is full of technology. Um, oh, BAC, Digital Media Commons and the Digital Act Studio, yes. There you go. You have access to a podcast studio where you can do your own podcast at your own time and launch this. Um, we do it in the alumni engagement office. We launched our uh, podcast, but these are resources that are not just there for our students, but also our alumni and the community as well. So, yes. Yes, the library is open to the community um, as a state, as a state funded library. UNCG's um, Jackson Library is open to any member of North Carolina. Uh, or any citizen of North Carolina. Um, we also provide um, special privileges to what we call friends of the library, uh, citizens of North Carolina who want to pay a $25 uh, membership fee to access the library uh, borrowing privileges and database access privileges. There are a few other perks um, that I won't go into detail with, but if you are interested in using UNCG's library, there are a lot of uh, access points for you and you are encouraged to do so because that is our charge. Thank you, Armando. That, that's a lot of information and very helpful information. Um, so I, I appreciate you plugging in your both areas of expertise. Um, Marisa, um, same question to you. Tell us about your majors, um, about the majors in your department or your area. But before you do that, we do have some questions coming in. I do want to encourage our um, audience to please plug in those questions into the comments and we will answer them as we are going with our discussion. Um, we are here for you to answer your questions. Our, our panelists are here to answer your questions. If you are interested um, in knowing more about these majors or the department or UNCG. Marisa, tell yeah. us. Gracias, Yuri. Um, I'll go over briefly the majors just because I know um, Wade Mackey has helped us um, compile a, a wide variety of these um, faculty videos that explain uh, most of these majors in detail. Um, but just to list a couple, um, I majored in um, Spanish education, which is one of the concentrations that um, languages, literatures, literatures and cultures offers. But they also offer about seven or nine languages, if I, if I don't remember correctly. And one of them is um, American Sign Language. Um, we also offer this new major, it's fairly new, about four years ago or whatnot. Um, it's called Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, um, but it has different co concentrations. And you can also take other languages um, to combine it with it. Um, I think that's it for now. But the, the video that Noelia goes into, I watched it and it goes into detail. You're on mute. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Marisa, for that. Um, so I have a a question here that came in. Hello, um, early in your college career, did a mentor help you choose your career path? Uh, let's go with you, Marisa. Yeah, I actually have the perfect story for that one um, because a faculty member did indeed very much influence my whole career since I started here on day one. Um, as we say in Spanish, but I said disco de rayado, you know, but I always say this, like getting to UNCG was such a challenge. I mean, I applied 13 times to FAFSA. No one around me was going to college like that looked like me, you know, Latinos. Everyone else were like, oh, have you applied to this and that? I'm like, I don't know. But when I got here, um, I was doing my CNA, whatnot, um, in high school. I was like, I want to be a nurse. I want to be a nurse. And then I got here and I failed my biology class. And I got a D in chemistry and you need a C in order to get it, in order to move on to the next level. Because if you don't pass these, you're a year behind. And then you also have to get admitted to the program, which is another thing. So there I am, my freshman self, trying to navigate this. And, and, I, and I do not lie. And I say that this class, Spanish 302, really was a class that 
I guess inspired me and let me stay here because I, I was as I would tell my mom I always go home and cry because I'm like I don't know what I'm doing mom no one around me is like helping me or anything you know so it was Dr. Sotomayor that first semester that was like hey Marissa like these are all the great things you can do like this is Spanish and whatnot and it was it was a bit hard because my mom told me she's like why do you want to be a Spanish major and I'm like because I want to teach Spanish. And my faculty member actually made it okay, Dr. Sotomayor, with my mom. She's like, look, it's not just a, fa a Spanish degree, it's more than that. Um, and she made it okay with it. And I really appreciate her to this day. So that's one little story. Thank you, Melissa. Our faculty here at UNCG, the moment that I stepped onto our campus, I heard many of them say, you, I am here for you, you pay me, utilize me. And I, that to me was like m one of the most valuable words that I had heard from any faculty um, ever because I never really thought about it that way. And yes, I am paying for this education for them to teach me but I really appreciated that because it made it more real that I could reach out and ask for this help. So um, we here at UNCG, I see a lot of bridging happening with our students and our faculty um, and our staff. So I, I do appreciate working here because of those that com camaraderie that we have with one another. Um, Armando, would you like to answer this, that question? What, um, I'm sorry, the, what I um, asked Marisa is, um, early in college career, did a mentor help you choose your career path? Oh, most definitely. If it was not for um, staff and faculty members, a faculty member in particular taking a personal interest in me and uh, helping me explore what my own ideas were, I would not be sitting here today. Uh, my junior year, I read a book called Stolen Legacy um, by George James, and I needed to know more about it. I went to the English department because I was an English major and nobody could tell me anything about it. They sent me to, a his to the history department. The history department could not tell me about it. It was talking about how uh, Greco-Roman culture was an antecedent or better yet, it was uh, borrowed from earlier Egyptian and Nubian cultures. History couldn't do it, so they sent me to religion. There was a new professor named Dr. Matthew Johnson. Dr. Matthew Johnson had his PhD from the University of Chicago. Um, and he was actually a psychoanalyst, but his PhD was in the philosophy of religion, right? Philosophy of religions. He was like, oh yeah, da, 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 da. That's, this is this, this is this, this is this. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you're interested in this, read this. <laughs> and he, he gave me some more stuff to read. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I wanted. So I came back like, whoa, there's more stuff. I read it and like, and I'm, I knew everything in the world because he just gave me something to read. He was like, oh good, you read that? Read this. So he just, a whole semester, he was like, okay, if you really like that, take my class next semester. And I took his class and he, every day there would be the normal readings and the extra readings he brought for me. That mentoring relationship has guided my life and career trajectory since at the very least 1998 to give context and perspective. That is one of my best friends like when, when we don't see each other every day, but he has always been a uh, guiding influence. Um, practically, that does not happen in every relationship you make in college, but over romanticizing it, 
ideally that's those type of relationships are created in college and those type of relationships are what in my opinion my personal experience as a as a student and my experience as a professional those experiences are what aid retention what we call retention in the professional class retention of first generation students uh first generation students, but students in general, those connections, those lifelong connections to ideas and people who help facilitate your exploration of them. I think thou, those are what make people successful in this realm. And I know in my personal experience to the original question, that mentoring relationship is an example of that. I invaluable. I mean, I, I quote the dude in my own scholarship. It shows how deep it goes. I lived with the dude. It, it, it helps. It helps. Yes, Dilly. Okay, so I wanted to jump in. I totally agree. I've had great mentors, but I wanted to just tell everybody out there, why would someone want to be a mentor? Why do faculty behave this way? And I want you to know that while it's great to teach college and it's really rewarding to be an expert in something, and I feel like I just went to class with Dr. Collins, I'm ready to go. I'm ready for him to assign me a paper or definitely something to read. Uh, but Homework this morning, good. this morning, I got a communication from a student who left UNCG with an undergraduate degree four years ago. And one of the things that she's done every time she's moved or started some new things, she's always kept in touch. She's always updated me. And I feel connected to her and her story, even though she's left us. And this morning she wrote me to say, I'm gonna start my PhD program in clinical psychology this week. And I know that she was gonna to go to that program, but she said, what advice do you have? What should I know? And it's so important for us to watch students be successful and reach their dream. There's nothing better because we can remember what it felt like to reach our dream. And so I just wanted to share that story to say, you know, it's true that not every relationship will go perfectly. Some people are busy, you know, it's hard to connect with people in the world. But when you go to college or you come to UNCG, if you put yourself out there enough and take enough classes and meet enough professors, somebody is going to make that connection with you. And then you'll have these kinds of experiences that you've heard tonight. So I just want you to know it's on both sides that it's just as rewarding to see someone and be excited by their learning for the first time as it is to take that first step and reach out and say, hey, I want to knock on your door or you know, give you a phone call. So um, I just had a great moment this morning and on the topic of mentorship, I just wanted to share it. I'm super proud of her for doing this. Thank you, Julie, for sharing that. Those, those are the stories that really just kind of give us that special on like someone is doing it. Someone's paving that way for themselves. Like we can do the same thing. That's right. And that's super rewarding. Um, I have a question for Wade. Um, what career options are there with the majors that are in your department? Thanks for the question. And, and I want to blend it in with the, the, the mentorship question. When you come to college, you'll be assigned an advisor. They should be great, but you can switch advisors at any time. And just like when I was a student, you start having to meet requirements, you express your interests, you'll get guided to courses, and you'll eventually find things that you both like and are good at and generally those are good things to stay with. I wanna tell you brief stories of three of my students from the liberal studies program, but don't just think of them as liberal studies students, think of them as any student because any program is gonna have similar stories. First, Cecilia Gonzalez, who graduated from liberal studies in 2014. Where did she go? What did she do? She went on to go to graduate school in counseling not immediately, you know, it's not clear why you would make that leap. She chose to make that leap and had the communication skills, the writing skills to do that. And she was working full time at the same time doing as a domestic violence advocate. 
Um, another student, Nor Ghazi, who graduated in 2017, went on to do a master's degree, but also just recently announced that she'll be teaching in the language, literatures, and cultures program. Just those two very different stories coming from the same major. A third student in 2019, Zan Nelson graduated. While a student, Zan was really interested in doing community outreach and activism. She was instrumental in arranging for the Virginia legislature to pass an apology for lynching. Right? And this made the local news because she wanted to be engaged with her community and use her degree to help learn how to network and argue and do writing and research to further her career goals. So that's just in one program in a three year span, three different students, wildly different endpoints. But if you come to college, especially at UNCG, you can get connected in a pipeline to take you where, where you don't even know you'll want to go. Like I never predicted I'd be living here doing what I do now when I was your age. Thank you. Thank you, Wade. Yes, that is very correct. You don't know where your major sometimes will take you. Um, and the path that you will take and the people you will meet, uh, connections, lifelong connections that you will make. So um, this next question is, why did you go into this field? And Julie, I'm gonna pose that to you. So I have a um, story about the fact that I wanted to be a biology major. Well, I was for a while and I wasn't really that good at it. Um, and so I think sometimes we think, you know, we have lots of interests. Um, we're human beings and um, sometimes it doesn't work out. It's a harder um, challenge. So I was in the middle of my biology studies. I was getting okay grades, but my family was saying, we don't think you're really that good at this. And I come from a family of educators and teachers in a very supportive and clear way. Um, they were saying it's time to make a change. So I thought for a long time about working in schools and I wanted to be a school counselor. And along the way, I realized that I could help people one at a time or I could keep going and get a PhD and teach lots and lots of people to help children in lots of lots of ways. And so everybody that I touch that graduates with a psychology degree, they know something about what children need to be happy and successful, how to manage stress and how to think about positive thoughts versus negative thoughts and how to reach out when you're struggling. And I really wanted to take the stigma out of asking for help, especially for young people. And so that passion really took me to psychology and um, I've really never looked back. It's an outstanding field and you can have an impact in lots of different careers. You can go into business, you can run a nonprofit organization in a community setting. You can go into the law and help with child custody um, evaluations or work in the foster care system, or you can go into a hospital setting and help with healthcare and medical needs. And if we think about the needs of our Latino people and communities, these are all careers that could benefit from our professionals knowing something about the needs and the strengths um, and making the services a little bit more accessible and a little bit more relevant for their lives and what they're looking for. And so everybody that's surrounding chance is always trying to think about access and giving people opportunities. And a psychology degree helps you understand how to do that because you learn about people. That is so true. Um, one of the things that I always heard was like this big warning sign of like psychology major, what you're not, you're not going to be able to do anything with this. And yeah, you can, you can adapt it. You can just uh, find the different ways that um, are unthinkable, I can't, to this day, I can't even tell you how I explain it to my parents, what I do, <laughs> because it is honestly unheard of. Um, in our culture, in Mexican culture, uh, the development world um, is 
almost unheard of. So anyways, engagement is, is a whole nother different animal for them to understand. Um, so yes, uh, are different majors in liberal arts or psychology, there are just different ways that you can adapt to create your own path. Um, Armando, I want to ask the same question to you. Why did you go into this field? Uh, it was a personal passion. Uh, I wanted, as an undergraduate, in terms of African American studies, I, I wanted to better understand uh, my world. Uh, from age 16 to college, I was reading African American literature without direction. Let's just say that, or for the most part, unguided. Uh, what I learned uh, through my college experience, uh, in part through the experience that I, I told you about, but through other experiences, was that uh, it could be crafted into a career trajectory and that there were other people doing it. And what I liked about what I do most or the was the ability to do things my own way. Ultimately, I could shape a, correct, uh, a career around my own intellectual interests and create a professional career for myself where I could be myself and study what I, I don't want to say fit in, still do what I wanted to do in the professional work and be successful in the ways I wanted to be successful. So that's what drew me to it. Thank you, Armando. Um, Julie, I just wanted to add to that with what Armando was talking about, that it's hard to think when you're not um, participating yet in higher education, you know, what is it gonna be like when I'm finished? Like, this is gonna be something you have earned for the rest of your life. and. Students who come to see me, they say, well, what grade did I get? Or how can I get this grade in your class? And I say, well, this is a journey. What do you wanna earn? What do you wanna get out of this? Um, and I think, you know, what a degree gives you is a sense of confidence and purpose and access to other people who are also trying to get degrees. And our goal is to get you out in the world so that you can take that education and you can have an impact in so many different ways. And you will be connected to this community for the rest of your days. And then you can turn around as an alumni um, and help build up the, the newer people in the community. So they call this legacy, right? Like someone who comes through UNCG and then their family members come as well. But your legacy lives on after you pursue that. And a degree really helps you chart your own course in a way that if you have to work right away, you have to follow a different set of rules and so it's really a privilege and some freedom to try to figure out how to get your degree. Um, and that's what we're here to try to help people figure out um, what's gonna be the best path for them to do that. Talking about just uh, helping students decide, what advice would you give a student who is undecided? Um, I'll, ask, I'll ask you, Julie, how do you help your students? Okay, and also I think Wade might know some ideas about, um, we use a word at UNCG um, to capture people who don't quite yet know what their path's going to look like, or maybe they have lots of different interests and it's hard to choose just one. Um, so we call it exploring. You can be in a, a, a declared kind of major that's an exploring major. And what we recommend that students do is really sample, take some basic courses that will meet certain requirements for your degree. We call this a sort of general education program. So there are just courses that you sort of have to take to be a well, um, well exposed student um, in different disciplines. But sometimes you'll take a course in philosophy or you'll take a course in languages, literatures and cultures and just suddenly it'll spark something for you. Um, and then you'll say, oh, I think I wanna take another class with that professor. And before you know it, um, it might turn into a major or even 
you know, just a minor and you find another um, class that you want. So you don't have to come here knowing right away um, that I want to be this and what classes do I have to take to get that. Uh, it's really actually in some ways much easier to have an open mind and to try out different things and find out where your talents are. That's the advice I would give. Wade, I would like to hear from you. So when you arrive as a student at UNCG, but many campuses would be similar, you're gonna have a class that's really structured around a welcome to college. It's gonna help you learn the ropes, learn the systems and how you, what, what your options are. Then as Julie said, you'll go through a bunch of requirements often referred to as general education. And those requirements are gonna involve a lot of choices. So you'll have to take a class in the humanities, a class in the sciences, but you can choose from a long list of options that fit your particular interests. Don't be in a hurry to pick a major. You have a couple years to decide and most students end up in a major that they didn't already come to select. Where everyone might know about biology or history, there's a lot of majors people don't think of there, but we call majors of discovery. And remember, you can have more than one major. I myself had more than one. I'm thinking when, when Julie was talking about one of the students I had in a class who was a dance major and an entrepreneurship major. So here's somebody who's in a performing arts school on one hand, but in a business school on the other hand, because she saw that I want to be in dance, but I also want to make money and have a business. And she wanted to have a dance studio. Right? So combining two seemingly very different things to help her achieve her objectives to meet her dream. So as you explore those first couple of years, you're going to learn about things that you never thought you'd be, that your parents didn't have on their list of how they envision your life going. And we have people here whose job it is in advising to help connect you and your interests and your aptitudes to those discoveries of majors and courses that will lead you to a career that's right for you. Thank you, Wei. I have this last question for Marisa. We are closing in on time, but Marisa, you have just started your PhD career. Tell me how that has, you know, how all of these moments have culminated to this of beginning your PhD. What is it that drove you to this moment? And um, what do you plan to do with your PhD afterwards? Wow, that's, that's a charged question. You mean, I don't know if I can fit it in in two minutes. I know we have some more time, but wow. Wow, I don't know where to even start on that one. Um, but it, my PhD was really never, ever, ever in my dreams. Just, it was, but it was a very long lost one. Um, because as you know, there's only, I think, 0.2% of Latinos in the US with a PhD. Um, and so it really just started when um, Dr. Lopez was like, hey, um, I was finishing my student teaching um, semester and I was um, teaching about 160 students. I was 21. I was 100 pounds. I was like, I cannot go into teaching right now, right away. So my professor um, that was the director of the languages, literatures, and cultures in Spanish, he told me about the master's in Spanish. And I was like, well, why not? Let's do it. And then there was no more assistantships. There was only one at the UTLC. And it was so cool to, to work at, at Spanish because you get to be with the professors and whatnot. So it was a little upset that I wouldn't work with them. But then UTLC ended up being my job and, and it ended up being now the ones that are supporting me um, through this PhD journey because without them um, and their support really, it, it can be a little hard. Um, but really why I'm doing my PhD is because of that same reason. In my Spanish, my Spanish 302 class, I felt, um, like I had never felt before in a classroom. I felt accepted and I felt like I could be my Latina self for one time. Um, and it could continued in other classes at UNCG as well. So in my mission and my passion of finding that, yes, I wanted to teach Spanish. I wanted to find other ways so that other students could feel validated, but also wanted this to be across other cultures and other students that are also facing the same problem. 
um, and other courses, not just at UNCG, just across the world, really. Um, and so that's what it put, really pushed me to want to pursue my PhD in educational leadership and cultural foundations, um, which gives me this other edge, right? I still use my Spanish education degree, but it helps me view this in a different lens where I hopefully I want to be faculty one day, full time, hopefully one day, or um, do this faculty development where I teach, um, not teach, but help and support other faculty um, go through these things as a student and as a teacher. So that's what I plan to do. We'll see where it goes. Like we said, majors and whatnot, they evolve and these opportunities go here and there. So we'll see, we'll see where we go. Thank you, Marisa, for that. Marisa is also a huge advocate of studying abroad. Um, she and I spoken about what study abroad um, brought to her and the experience of, you know, here at UNCG, there's a lot of opportunity for that. Of course, not right now, but in the future, things will change uh, for the better and we will be able to go and explore these different countries again and expose ourselves to these um, different languages, cultures, and, um, and utilize the, those, um, those learning opportunities to, to grow. So I want to thank you guys for this opportunity of letting me know, be in your brain more and listen to your stories um, because each and one of us are very different. We walked a very different journey, uh, di different journey and a path that we paved ourselves with the help of others because we wouldn't be where we are without the help of others. And that to me means a lot. I know that you all have poured so much into me. Um, I'm learning from, from one another. So thank you. I appreciate your time and your talent. Um, if you guys have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us here at, um, at UNCG. You are welcome to um, reach out to us through our Facebook um, page and or Instagram as well. Um, or you can also um, email us uh, if you happen to look at our names and Google us you'll find us in, um, in the UNCG uh, directory. Um, as a last thought or last invitation, uh, we have our episode four coming up, Careers After UNCG, September 3rd at 6.30. And this opportunity is to explore what UNCG and beyond looks like. Um, alumni, uh, you know, get to tell you a little bit more, but also what is the career professional development um, path that you need to be on? So there are different ways. And here at UNCG, my job is to connect you back to alumni so that you can utilize their resources, um, bringing their expertise to have do what we call our coffee breaks um, and tell you more about their you know, field and um, and give you the tools so that you learn something new and build. So thank you again. I hope to see you September 3rd at 6.30, Careers After UNCG. Thank you so much. Buenas noches.